What's up guys, welcome back to the Daily Stock Picks. And in this video, we'll be going over the top seven stocks that you should consider buying right now, according to this article by Investors Place. So what I'll be doing for you guys today is I'll be reading over this article with my beautiful voice, commenting, and will conduct my own quantitative analysis to see whether these seven stocks either belong in our dividend portfolio or our value portfolio by using this checklist. Make sure that you stick around till the end of the video because we'll be going into the itty bitty details about these companies. And if you feel like that you got a lot of value from this and feel like being amazing, make sure that you smash the like button. I mean, literally smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. I would really appreciate it. Now, without a further ado, let's get it started. So seven cloud stocks to buy now for long term profits. Money no longer comes out of the ground. It rains down from the clouds. <laughs> Oh yeah, by Dana Blackehorn, Investor Place contributor. If you want to make money in 2020, the easiest way was to buy the cloud. It worked for me. Much of my profits over the last year have from come from cloud SaaS, five companies whose cloud computing data centers define the global economy. After all, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and Facebook are the most valuable companies in the world. Reaching such rare field heights wasn't easy. It took some risky moves. Facebook spent incredible sums amount of money before segment revenues could justify the price tags to name just one. AT&T and IBM passed on the $1 billion per quarter entry fee and their shares have now paid a terrible price. The cloud SaaS now spend about $4 billion in capital expenditure each quarter to expand and maintain their market share. The sixth most valuable company in the world is China's leading cloud emperor, Alibaba, ticker symbol BABA. -A. You could also buy Chinese clouds through Tencent Group Holdings, owner of WeChat or Baidu, which runs the country's largest search engine. But these aren't the only ways to profit from the cloud trend. You can buy into big application providers like Netflix and Salesforce, whose rentals of cloud resources let them scale to global dominance. You can buy cloud center hardware or software producer providers. Here are some stocks I have covered recently. Okay, the market remains somewhat volatile, but day trading aside, secular macro trends will sustain this sector higher. So the first company in this list is Alibaba, a Chinese cloud emperor. Okay, pretty big name. So the Trump administration doesn't want you to invest in Alibaba. However, those who may have serious money in 2020, Alibaba shares are up 37% year to date. Baba stock opened for trade August 27th around $289 per share, trading at 85 times last year's earnings for a total market cap of $783 billion. Shares are now supported by a listing in Hong Kong that gives Alibaba easier access to Chinese investment capital. Shares are also supported by the coming IPO of Ant Financial. Alibaba owns one third of the company. Those shares will be listed in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Ant made $1.3 billion during the pandemic quarter ending in March. The IPO has an estimated value of $225 billion. So in Alibaba's June quarter report, released August 20th, revenue was up 34% year over year and profits more than doubled. About 30% of the company's $21.76 billion of revenue hit the net income line. While most of that revenue came from merchandise sales, Alibaba doesn't hold merchandise. Rather, suppliers take on that risk. That along with its cloud computing and financial units mean its profit margins are closer to that of Facebook and than Amazon. Alibaba has more powerful cloud capability than any US counterpart. The company does accounting and business management like Microsoft. It handles financial transactions like Visa. It offers digital content services like Amazon, including gaming. So it's well diversified from coming from this article. So while Amazon's cloud SaaS are under antitrust threat from politicians in both parties, China has given its cloud emperors a green light. That's why 
Sushina Research recently raised its price target on Alibaba to $350, 21% ahead of its current price. Okay, let's have a look at BABA, BABA. If you were to look at the price to earnings ratio, which is basically how many times the price is when compared to its earnings, we can see that Alibaba is almost near the S&P 500 index of 30.26. Now, in order for a company to meet my dividend portfolio, it needs to meet four rules or satisfy the four rules. And these four rules are based on these three books that I read. The first book is A Dividend Still Don't Lie by Kelly Wright, who run their own website called Investment Quality Trends. Make sure that you check it out, a highly recommended website. You can gain or pick up a lot of information from this book. And now the second book is Get Rich With Dividends, A Proven System for Earnings a Double Digit Returns by Mark. And the third book is The Ultimate Dividend Playbook by Josh Peters. The rules are as follows. So the rule number one is a mandatory field. The current free cash flows must be positive. So we wanna be making sure that the free cash flows that the company is able to generate is positive so that you can sleep well at night knowing that your money is working for you right and rule number two is dividends that are paid out should not be more than 75 percent of the current free cash flows what do i mean by this so we want to be making sure that the company has at least 25 percent of its free cash flows being reinvested back into the business or at least being on its balance sheet because you don't know when a storm might come through and wash away the profits or it might come into any financial troubles so that 25 percent is sort of like a buffer that i like to look for and rule number three is that these companies should be consistently been increasing its dividends over the past five years if you want to be on the more conservative side you can look for 10 years or more right and rule number four is our buy criteria so we will only be buying this company when the current dividend yield is greater than or equal to the five-year dividend average so what this rule does it makes sure that we're buying the stock at a markdown price when compared to its previous five-year history, right? Now, let's have a look at the website called Whitechats. They do a really good representation of the financial information in the financial statements as a picture format or like a visual aspect. I like to look stuff visually, if you know what I'm saying. So, the revenue has been increasing consistently. The cash flows has also been increasing consistently, but it hasn't been paying out dividends since 2015. As a result, this can be a part of our dividend portfolio because we need to have at least five years. So free cash flows, definitely yes. And it doesn't pay out a dividend. And as a result, there's no point in looking at it as a dividend perspective, right? So Alibaba, out of the dividend portfolio. Now let's see if the company meets our value portfolio. In order for the company to be a part of the value portfolio, it needs to meet five rules this time, right? So the five rules are based on these three books that I read. The first book is The New Buffettology by Mary Buffett, who is the daughter-in-law of Warren Buffett, or used to be, I think. And the second book is Rule One, Investing by Phil Town. Pretty good rule, uh, pretty good book. I would highly recommend reading this book as he goes over the technical indicators and stuff like that as well for all those technical investors who based their trades on fundamentals. And uh, the rule number three is the little book that still beats the market by Joel Greenbat, where he goes over his infamous magic formula. And the rules are as follows. So the first rule is that the return on invested capital must be greater than or equal to 10. So the higher this number, the more profitable it is. So I put a star behind besides it is because I might consider buying the company even if it's below return, uh, below 10% uh, of this return on invested capital number if it has a phenomenal balance sheet and the fundamentals are pretty strong for that and the company is at a markdown, then I would go for that. And rule number two is that it needs to have a consistent net cash flows. So we need to make sure that the company is able to generate cash, this cash cow, and we should be able to project these cash flows at least 10 years from now to a certain extent or ballpark it. Yep. And the rule number three is that it needs to have a strong balance sheet. So a lot of investors tend to see the debt to equity ratio, but I like to look at the long-term debt and how, see how many years that it will take the company to clear that off from its balance sheet. 
uh, as it gives us the most accurate representation of the debt, all right? And a good rule of thumb is that we are looking for a number of years, as uh, six years or less than six years for the company to wipe off the long-term debt from its balance sheet. And rule number four and rule number five are our buy criteria. So according to rule number four, we want to be buying the stock when it is at a 20% discount from the fair price, which we'll be calculating in a few seconds. Make sure that you stay tuned and pay real close attention, yeah? And if rule number four isn't met, we can look at investing into a particular or said company if based on the price to earnings multiple. So if the current price to earnings ratio is lesser than the S&P 500 index and lesser than the five year highest price to earnings ratio, we would consider buying the company based on rule number five. Now coming to Alibaba, we can have a look at these fundamentals. The return on investor capital is 17.11%, so definitely greater than 10. And the minimum that I could see so far was somewhere around 12% over the past 10 years, showing that the company does seem to have a long-term competitive mode working in its favor, right? Now, free cash flows, yes. Let's see how much they would have increased. So it was around $404 million. Now let's see how many times it's doubled. So. 400 doubles is 800, 800 double is 600, 1600, 1600, 3200, 3200, 6400, 6400 is 12800, 12800. So nearly five, it's not quite six doubles yet, but it's around five doubles. So around 50% year over year increase over the past 10 years, if you were to look at it in terms of long-term perspective. It's just a rough calculation. So that's a pretty good growth number looking at the scenario. Now let's check the balance sheet out. It has $17 billion in its long-term debt, which it easily can clear off with its current assets of $69 billion, right? So the current assets is basically the most liquid assets that can be converted into cash within 12 months. So within 12 months or in a span of a year, it should be able to clear it off instantaneously if the management chooses to do so without even touching the free cash flows, which is pretty amazing. Now, let's see whether what the intrinsic value of the company is. We can see that the earnings per share is $3.9.30. And let's see the price to ratio range. It has been trading over the past five years, 14.17, 62.67. Okay. And the analysts are estimating that the company, hmm, that's strange, uh, that the company could grow at somewhere around 3.33%. Okay, now what we're doing here is we're taking this earnings and we're projecting into the future by using this particular growth rate and we'll arrive at X amount of dollars per share in terms of earnings, right? And we want to be multiplying that earnings with the proper price to earnings ratio so that we can arrive at the price at that particular point in time. So if you were to consider uh, the five year average, it would be 38.42 and or time two times the analyst estimates, which would be 6.66. So to be on the conservative side, we should always select the minimum one. If you were to look at that, it would be $83.19 per share. And the ideal price at which you should be buying the stock is $23, but we never want to be paying that out at that particular point. We want to be paying at least at a 50% discount, right? So 50% discount would look like $11.82. We know that the price target hasn't reached that stage because Alibaba stock is currently trading at somewhere around $296 at the time of this recording. So it doesn't meet our value perspective in terms of rule number four, but let's have a look at rule number five right the current price to earnings ratio should be less than 50 percent of the highest price to earnings ratio over the past five years price to earnings ratio was highest at 62.67 so it is at a discount with its current price to earnings ratio of 30.96 and it should be cheaper than the s p 500 index since it's almost equivalent to the s p 500 index i would consider alibaba as a part of a, a value portfolio because hey it does have a really good competitive advantage a really good balance sheet and a return good return on invested capital amount 
and it's just amounting near to the S&P 500 index and it is at a discount when compared to the five year highest price to earnings multiple. So as a value perspective portfolio, it meets our rule number five. All right, now let's have a look at the next company in this list. So the next company is Google. Is Google overpriced? If Alphabet, the parent company of Google is overpriced then the whole market is. Okay. The company's market cap recently blew past $1 trillion for the second time this year. Its earnings, price to earnings multiple is more than 35 compared to the Nasdaq average of 22. The reason is the cloud, which Google helped develop in the 2000s. Cloud computing applications have transformed our lives over the last decade. This change has accelerated over the last several months, but Google, which once had the informal corporate slogan, don't be evil, is viewed with increasing suspicion by Western policymakers. Google's $2.1 billion acquisition of Fitbit, a fitness brand company that was going nowhere, has yet to be approved. Google has promised not to use Fitbit data in marketing, but Fitbit shares have not joined Google's rise this year. Before Google announced off the latest concession to regulators in an effort to get a merger done, Fitbit was down on the year. Yet there are bigger problems. Google's dominance in search ads is also said to be the top priority of the US antitrust corps. States are focused on Google's advertising business while the Department of Justice looks at its dominance in search. Chamath Palihapitiya, a former Facebook executive, whose social capital fund has been a big winner on Tesla, has been building a Google bear case. That case is based on Google's status as an incumbent and the growing difficulty of using earnings with acquisitions, regulation, taxation, and the brittleness that drove down Microsoft early in the century are real risks, he writes. But America's critics forgot that Google is a global business. American and even European laws are local ordinances. The company has $120 billion in cash to deploy and dominates in global mobility with Android. It's a default search engine for Apple as well. Every king's crown hangs heavy and Google is no exception. In just 23 years, it has gone from a startup to a global dominance. Critics see the power of its open opponents. Investors should be aware of its growing power, political as well as financial. If I were investing with a 10 year time horizon, I wouldn't fear Google stock. Everything is overpriced right now with the Chinese as the alternative. The cloud SaaS won't be taken down. Okay, now let's have a look at Google. So ticker symbol is G-O-O-G. So definitely overvalued when compared to the S&P 500 index because it currently has 37.43 as a price to earnings multiple. Let's see if Google pays a dividend. I don't think it does. Uh, yep. Um, well, we can still analyze the free cash flows. The revenue, almost a straight line. Free cash flows. There were here hiccups here and there, but let's see how much it has increased. 17, seven double is 14, 14 double is 28. So around two doubles, so around 20% year over year increase over the past 10 years. So since it doesn't pay out a dividend, we wouldn't be considering this as a part of our dividend portfolio because that's the main criteria in order to meet the dividend portfolio, right? Now let's see in terms of our value prospect. The return on invested capital is 17.75 and the lowest that I could find was 8.46 back in 2017. But it seems to be a one-off thing because on an average, it is about 10%. So yes, return on invested capital greater than 10% definitely meets. Cash flows, definitely yes, positive, no dividends. Let's see, look at the balance sheet. It has $2.963 billion in long-term debt, which it easily can clear off with its current assets of $149 billion. So held to the year, pretty good, strong balance sheet. Now let's look at the intrinsic value. So it currently has $45.47 per share. as its earnings and the lowest is 21.48 and 65.47 the price to earnings range and the Wall Street analysts are currently expecting that the company could grow somewhere around 6.09 percent 
So considering the minimum of these two, we can see that the intrinsic value would be somewhere around $942. The fair price at which we should buy in the stock is $268.02. And the right price, considering at least a 20% markdown from this fair price is $214. We know that Apple, sorry, Google is currently trading at $1,600 per share. So as a result, it doesn't meet our value portfolio either with its current valuations. Maybe, I don't think that it ever will because we're like consistent, like considering the most conservative price to earnings multiple for these sort of calculations, but it could meet the price to earnings ratio of rule number five. But with the current valuations right now, it doesn't seem to be an attractive one at the moment because it is slightly more than 50% of the five year markdown and expensive than the S&P 500 index. As a result, it doesn't belong either in a part of a dividend portfolio, but maybe a value portfolio if uh, the price earnings multiple or the share price came down a little bit. Now, the third company in this list is Amazon overbought and overvalued by any conventional measure amazon is overvalued with a market cap of 1.64 trillion dollars amazon is worth more than four times its potential 2020 revenue of 400 billion dollars the bay that's based on a second quarter sales of 1.1 101 billion dollars it's not unusual to value a tech company at 10 times its sales or even more but amazon isn't really a technical tech company as i've written many times before amazon is an infrastructure company about 80 percent of its sales come from retailing usually valued at a discount to the revenue even granting that amazon is taking full value from its sales it, the cost of warehousing and delivery mean margins are slim just 3.5% in North America for the first half of 2020, valuing Amazon Web Services at even 20 times sales or $800 billion still leaves $850 billion in equity covering $320 billion in retail value. Despite these facts, analysts are pounding the table for Amazon in a way they almost never do. There are now 39 analysts following Amazon according to tip rank and 38 of them are screaming a buy. The average one-year price target of $3,725 represents a gain of 13% from its $3,300 opening price on August 24. The best, the big second quarter numbers caused 27 analysts to raise their price targets by the start of August. Needham analyst Laura Martin recently said Amazon could be worth $5,000 per share over the long term. Martin's bull case is based on the idea that it's worth more together than broken up. But a breakup is what Senator Elizabeth Warren and the New York professor, university professor Scott Galloway, among others, are calling for. Even without a breakup, regulation is coming. And regulation always comes with a price tag for the regulated. Amazon current price is built on the CVPD market and the wide ranging actions of the Fed. The price isn't based on Amazon's performance or any other kind of fundamentals. There's so much money floating around and the stocks are so liquid. It's no surprise cash is floating into these stocks. But liquidity works both ways. Easy money flowing in can quickly become profit taking that snowball, snowballs into a dip and finally a rout uh, before small investors can respond. That's what happened to the whole market in March. The pandemic and will make others think um, other things look cheap. Failure to stop the pandemic will make the economic damage too obvious to ignore. Either way, Amazon stock will eventually reflect its fundamental value. Fortunately, those fundamentals are great. Okay, pretty good uh, bullish thesis over here by this writer. So, um, Current price to earnings ratio of Amazon is 134, which is definitely overvalued when compared to the S&P 500 index in terms of just its price to earnings ratio. Now let's see if Amazon stock pays out a dividend. Ticker symbol AMZN. Nope, no dividend. So as a result, it doesn't meet our dividend portfolio, but we can definitely see if it meets our value portfolio. AMZN. We can see that the return on investor capital is 15.2% which is definitely up about 10%. And we can see that it has been negative a couple of years 
below 10 but currently 15.20 it's a pretty good number for a company of this particular scale and size now coming to the net cash flows we can see that the net cash flows have been increasing 2.5 double is 5 5 double is 10 10 double is 20 so around 30 percent year over year because of it has doubled three times i had a compounding annual growth rate so the net cash flows yes they are positive and now look coming to the balance sheet it has around 33 billion dollars in long-term debt which it easily can clear it off with its current assets that it has of 110 billion dollars within the coming 12 months if the management chooses to do so now coming to the intrinsic value calculation we can see that the earnings per share for the company is around 26 dollars and one cents and the price to earnings ratio that it has been trading for the past 10 years sorry for the past five years is 70.68 1005.75 and the analysts are currently estimating that the company could grow around 36 0.03 to be considering on the most conservative side we can see that the company is price to earnings ratio should be somewhere around 72 and putting that at that particular valuation the intrinsic value is around 20,000 around 30,000 dollars if you were to round it off and the fair price at which you should be buying the stock is 8,400 dollars and the current valuation is below the 50 percent markdown because it's currently trading at 3,000 four hundred and ninety nine dollars and twelve cents so it is a definitely more than a fifty percent discount when compared to to its intrinsic value so looking at that so definitely a value buy as it satisfies rule number four All right now let's have a look at the next stock is Facebook how the world communicates there is an assumption that Facebook is an American media company built on advertising. That would make it vulnerable to a boycott by American advertisers, upset that it still lets president supporters make full use of the service. But Facebook is not a media company. It's not even an American anymore. Only 10% of its monthly active users are in the US or Canada. 41% are in Asia. India is in fact Facebook's largest market. That means Facebook must navigate between rulers and ruled everywhere it does business and hew to one policy everywhere how might indian president modi react or facebook decides to exile its supporters because their content wasn't trustworthy how might dozens of american dictators whose people have become equally dependent upon facebook react to the companies taking a political stance of the 10 largest social networks based on the number of global users, Facebook owns four Facebook itself, Facebook, Facebook itself, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Facebook services are now integral to global economy, not least before they're free. In countries like India, where the media annual income was just $616.29, in 2019, that's important. Further, Facebook owns its own cloud, meaning it can deliver services like shopping or banking with instant credibility. Services like banking and shopping aren't dependent on advertising, so global pandemic offers a unique opportunity to launch these products. CEO and co-founder Mark Zuckerberg has deliberately repositioned Facebook as a global communications company. Companies like AT&T, which held this position in the past, cast themselves as common carriers. They were acquired, required to provide service regardless of co content, while accompanying with government orders on things like wiretaps. In 1990, communications mean, meant voice. Today, it means anything that can be digitized. In 1990, most communications was two-way. Today, anything can be broadcast and often is. This makes Facebook far more powerful than AT&T was. And because of its global footprint, far more vulnerable, if Facebook defies Trump might it defy Modi? If Facebook pays Rupert Murdoch for news in Australia, how long before it's paying him in the UK or in the US? This is the risk in Facebook stock. Zuckerberg faces a challenge in navigating between politicians and their people, not just in America, but abroad as well, as he faces the additional hurdle of creating services that can ride on more than 
ad revenue, but its cloud gives Facebook the scale and power to meet these challenges. Okay, let's have a look at Facebook stock, ticker symbol FB. Unfortunately, so as far as we got here, none of the companies have been paying a consistent dividend. Hopefully, some of the companies that we look down the line do offer this. Okay, now let's have a look at Facebook stock. Does it pay a dividend? No, it doesn't. So not a part of the dividend portfolio. Now let's look at it in terms of a value perspective. Ticker symbol FB. The return on investor capital is pretty good, 19.88%. And the lows that we can see that it reached was back in 2012 when it was 0.58%. Uh, but it, I think it was just a one-off thing. But apart from that, on an average, it's about 10%. So that's pretty good. Now, looking at Facebook's revenue, it's been increasing consistently, like almost like a straight line. The free cash flows, let's see how many times it's doubled. $400 million, 400 double is 16, 800, 800 double 1 1.6, 3.2, 6.4, uh, 12.8, 24. So around, 50% year over year increase in terms of its free cash flows over the past five years. It's just a ballpark figure. So definitely a positive free cash flows, yes, and consistent free cash flows. And the long-term debt is literally zero and it has a really good current asset position of $68.13 billion on its balance sheet. So definitely a strong balance sheet. And the earnings per share is $8.19 currently. And looking at the fluctuations in the price to earnings ratio, we can see that Facebook has been trading somewhere around 17.32 and 110.11. Okay, and the analysts at Wall Street are estimating that Facebook could grow as much as 17.05% in the coming five years. We'll just project that into 10 years for now for the simplicity of the calculation. So looking at the intrinsic value, we can see that the company might be worth somewhere around $1,150 10 years from now. And the fair price at which you should be buying the stock is $327. And the margin of safety ideally is $163. But if you were to look at a markdown, we should be considering buying the stock somewhere around $261 range, which is currently more on the expensive side. As a result, it wouldn't meet our dividend of value portfolio as per rule number four. And as per rule number five, it is lesser than the five year highest price to earnings ratio, but it's not cheaper than the rest of the market. As a result, Facebook doesn't seem to belong either in our dividend portfolio or our value portfolio by our fundamental checklist. Next company is Palo Alto Networks, ticker symbol PANW, the cloud security leader. You don't have to just buy cloud computing. You can buy services the cloud depend on. On one of the services is security. Right now, Palo Alto Networks looks like the winner in cloud security segment. Of course, a call like this is always tentative. New algorithms, concepts, and threats can overturn a market lead overnight. But right now, the momentum is on Palo Alto's side and investors are buying the stock. On August 26, Palo Alto stood at $262 per share. That's a market cap of $25 and two billion for a company that's just reported sales of $3.4 billion for the year ending in July. Palo Alto software is described as the next generation firewall. Unlike older products that protect the perimeter of the network, Palo Alto creates IDs around apps, content users, and devices, both inside and outside the network. That means it can protect not just internal resources, but software delivered as a service, so SaaS. Its concept called Secure Access Service Edge, SASE, SASE, there's zero trust and continuous monitoring of applications and data, minimizing risk. The approach makes Palo Alto a work from home winner. It's driving growth of 20% per year in revenue, which CEO Nikesh Arora believes is sustainable. The Gartner Magic Quadrant has Palo Alto in the upper right leader position for the next generation firewalls. Aurora is also a part of Palo Alto's secure sauce. He was 
once seen as heir apparent to Mayos Shison at South SoftBank. His key years were spent at Alphabet, where Eric Schmitz called him the finest analytical businessman he had ever met. Aurora's latest splash in Cypress Group, a digital forcenic outfit, Palo Alto is buying for $265 million, while Palo Alto software can predict and prevent most attacks. Crypsis can mitigate the effect of successful attacks. That knowledge can, and that knowledge can then be fed back to Palo Alto's products. Palo Alto is also turning its security orchestration system into a marketplace with add-on packs that turn its customers into resellers. Knowing that you don't know it all is the key to wisdom. Palo Alto has had nearly $3 billion in cash on hand at the end of July and seems to have the right approach for the current computing environment. If you're buying computer security stocks, Palo Alto is your best bet right now. Okay, Palo Alto, ticker symbol P-A-N-W. Looking at the wider S&P 500 index, we can see that it doesn't have a price to earnings ratio because the earnings might have been negative. That's why it's coming up as NA. P-A-N-W. Let's see if it does pay out a dividend. Looking at this, no dividend here. On with the next part to see if it belongs in our value portfolio. P-A-N-W. Okay, the return on investor capital is minus 7.41. We don't want to be looking into companies that are actually bleeding money when compared to its returns. So as a result, I wouldn't waste any time considering this company in the value portfolio because we wanna be looking for companies that are higher than zero, ideally above 10%, right? And the reason why it came up as NA is because the earnings per share is my negative $2.75. So it's right now currently bleeding money, but the free cash flows do have some perspective to it but I wouldn't be comfortable investing in this company because you might be taking a significant amount of risk. Here, we want to be downsiding our significant risk. Okay, now, uh, Palo Alto Networks, we've already done that. Now let's have a look at the next company. It's Salesforce, ticker symbol CRM. Welcome to the Dow. The success of the cloud in 2020 can be summed up in just one fact. In August, Salesforce, a 20 year old cloud-based software provider was added to the Dow 30 replacing Exxon Mobile. Salesforce may be the first company to join the average with no one in the office to celebrate. Workers return has been delayed until at least next summer by the CVPD. Salesforce was founded to sell applications based on Oracle database software as a service. Salesforce passed Oracle in the market cap in July and is now almost $20 billion ahead. Salesforce usually beats earnings estimates. It did so again during the most recent quarter, sending the shares still higher. Analysts were expecting earnings of 67 cents per share, hoping for 69. On average of $4.9 billion, they got blown out earnings of $2.85 per share on an average of $5.15 billion. Salesforce was born before the cloud, but it has alliances with Amazon, Microsoft's Azure and Alphabet's Google Cloud, alongside with nine data centers, Salesforce manages its own on its own. It offers redundant copies of the applications from all major business centers, meaning increased system stability and security. The Dow announced puts more lift under Salesforce shares. Funds that track the average will now have to buy and hold Salesforce stock. So that can be like a really good upside if you were to look at it. This is also all ironic because Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff famously said capitalism is dead at the Dover's conference this year. What he really meant was companies must honor employees, customers, and the environment, not just the shareholders. Salesforce has been an analyst favorite. The stock has risen an average of 40% year each year for the past five years, almost 700% over the last 10 years. It is a buy and hold stock right now. 21 of the 21 five analysts on tip ranks say buy Salesforce. Okay, now let's have a look at CRM stock. Okie dokie.
Oh, well, that takes a lot. Let's just type in the ticker symbol CRM to see if it does belong in our dividend portfolio. It doesn't pay a dividend, so it's out of the dividend portfolio. But let look, let's look at it as from a value perspective. CRM, 0.46, not attractive at all. Okay. But let's keep pushing forward. Oh yeah, finally loaded up. CRM is around price earnings multiple of 110, which is expensive when compared to the S&P 500 index. So as a result, we know that rule number five is not going to be met. And it's not greater than 10%, which I like to see, but the free cash flows are pretty good. This is the consistent cash flows that I'm talking about. So over the past 10 years, $90 million. Let's see how many times it's doubled. So let's just consider it as 100 for simplicity. 100 double is 200, 200 double is 400, 400 double is 800, 800 double is 1600, 1600 double is 3.2 billion dollars. So around 50% increase, over 50% increase year over year in terms of its free cash flow growth, which is pretty good and bananas if you were to look at the projections there, right? And so net cash flow is yes, and the balance sheet 2.6 billion dollars, which is can easily cover with its current assets of $14.85 billion. So definitely a yes. And the price that we're looking for should be at least at a 20% markdown. That's the only criteria it will meet. The rule number five won't be met because it's more expensive than the S&P 500 index here. So the earnings per share is $2.56. And let's see the price to earnings ratio. CRM 75966.80 so definitely on discount okay analysts are estimating that the CRM stock could grow at nearly 20% so 19.48 so the conservative growth estimate that you should be buying this is 38.96 the intrinsic value of the company is $494, the fair price $140, and the price that we should be entering the stock is $112.54. Since it is on the most expensive side, we wouldn't be considering this as a part of our value portfolio in terms of rule number four or rule number five due to its price to earnings ratio. We do want the stock to fall a little bit down or maybe around the $112 range. If it does, it is going to be a definitely a good buy. But currently, not right now, though. Now, the next company in this list is Workday, ticker symbol W-D-A-Y. Everything new becomes prosaic. When it comes to the cloud, investors are always chasing the next shiny object, a niche that seems earth-shaking when it, it opens will once its mind seem prosaic and stayed. That's the story of Workday. It has proven the value of its niche human resource databases in the cloud and expanded it into finance and enterprise management. Much as Salesforce began with the disgruntled Oracle salesman, Workforce began life with people upset over an Oracle acquisition. In this case, it was PeopleSoft, which Oracle bought in 2005 in a hostile takeover. Two PeopleSoft veterinarians decided to launch a competitor utilizing the cloud and Workday was born. The company 2012 IPO valued it at $9.5 billion. It has more than quadrupled its value since. Workday has copied a lot of things Salesforce did right. It has a partner uh, ecosystem selling their improvements to its software and has cultivated a reputation as a great place to work. While other companies cut pay at the start of the pandemic, Workday handed out bonuses. It has also laterally expanded its market niche. What started as a human resource company is now a business development manager with financial management applications. The problem for Workday is that the success breeds expectations of even more success. At some point, every company will fall short and expectations will, expectations will rack it downward. That's the story of Workday's first quarter results. The numbers were fine. They were just short of expectations. Workday remains in a market niche 
that's still growing a niche where analysts at Gartner say Workday is the leader. Workday software keeps improving marked by a cut in the time it takes to deploy. Workday is also firming up its cloud alliances. It has a new effort with Microsoft and a new partnership with Salesforce. Analysts expecting an economic recovery say it's time to buy Workday. When speculators run to the shiny objects, they leave great businesses alone. That's what seems to be happening here. Over the last five years, Workday has averaged 50% gain each year. The fact that it's lagging now may spell opportunity for patient investors. Okay, Workday. What's the same ticker symbol for this? W-D-A-Y. So it has a negative earnings. Uh, that's why it's not coming up with the uh, price to earnings ratio. Doesn't pay out any dividends, so it can be a part of our dividend portfolio here. It's minus 13.91%. As a result, I wouldn't be considering uh, workforce as a part of our value portfolio either. All right. So out of all of these seven companies, it seems that two companies are currently at a markdown and they don't pay out any dividends, but they are in terms of a value buy, they are good to buy. First is the Alibaba stock and the next is the Amazon stock based on this article and based on this pr appropriate checklist that I've created. Now, closing remarks, Dana Blackhorn has been a financial and technology journalist since 1978. His latest book is Technology Big Bang, Yesterday, Tomorrow, Today and Tomorrow with Moore's Law. Essays on technology available at Amazon's Kindle store. Write him at so-and-so email or follow him on Twitter at this. As of this writing, he owns shares in Baba, Amazon, Apple and Microsoft. All right. Done with the article. So if you guys have stayed around till this part of the video, I really appreciate it guys. Thank you so much. If you guys do feel like being amazing, make sure that you smash the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon so that you can get notified as soon as we post these videos. You can listen to these videos like a podcast just so that like you can hear my beautiful voice and stuff and uh, make the deductions. And if you want to get a visual perspective, watch the video. So. Full disclosure guys, this video is for education and entertainment purposes only. There is no guarantee that you'll earn any money using the techniques and ideas mentioned in this video. This is not financial advice. Please consult your financial or tax professional prior to making an investment in these companies. And once again, appreciate it guys and catch you in the next video. Peace.